Good morning and welcome to all RLC families and guests. We're so happy that you could all join us today and we hope you and your families are doing well. Those of you joining us from home, welcome. Hope you're all blessed and just appreciate you guys tuning in. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eric Furbeck. I'm one of the uh, head, head ushers here at Resurrection Life Church. I think I've been serving in this ministry for the majority of the time that we've been attending RLC, and we've been doing so for 20 years. My wife and I <laughs> came here about 20 years ago, and uh, we we're happy to just be blessed there, you know, every week, being a part of this uh, great church and raise our family here. Um, have our girls serving and being blessed as well. Uh, uh, if you're here for the first time, I'm so glad that you could join us today. If you would please fill out uh, the form that's in your welcome brochure and take it to the welcome center off the foyer after the service. Uh, we have a special gift we'd like to give you. Also, if anyone here has a prayer request, there is also a form in the brochure for you to share your prayer needs. Uh, you can fill that out and drop the form in one of the offering stands, give it to an usher, or take it to the welcome center. Um, there are no birthdays or anniversaries on my list today, but there are several this week, so check out the RLC uh, November calendar, uh, which is located on the RLC website or church app, so you don't miss a thing. Uh, regarding our digital announcements, they are available on our Facebook page, our Twitter uh, posts, and uh, church app. Uh, we would like to remind everyone that our services can be located on our Facebook and YouTube pages. Um, regarding giving, we thank you so much for all of your generosity every week. And uh, just as a reminder for different ways to give, you can do so traditionally through our mail, uh, giving stations at our exits, uh, online on our website, or through our church app. Um, the word for you today, devotionals uh, for December through February are now available in the Welcome Center. RLC members may pick one up um, after service or in between services next week. And um, a comp uh, you, you may also pick up an additional uh, copy for donation. Um, this is the, s the final week for life care meetings. Um, Journey of Recovery meets uh, this Friday at 7 p.m. at RLC. Please see uh, Pastor Gabe or Judy Alvarez if you have any questions. All adults are welcome. Um, operation with regarding Operation Christmas Child, um, we got one week left to build on this pile over here. <laughs> it's got blessings going all over the world over there. Um, please, not, please sign out boxes at the display counter in the foyer, and uh, please sign up if you can to help out at the drop-off center. Um, when you bring in filled boxes, please check off your name and stack the boxes right over here at the front of the sanctuary. Um, lastly, I have an encouraging word, if you can all stand up. Um, this is coming from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we are able to give them the same comfort God has given us. So we are blessed to be a blessing. Amen. Let's just join praise and worship. Good morning, church family. We were made to worship him this morning. His word says that it's in him we live and move and have our being. So let's go ahead and sing today. If we're online or if we're in here in person, let's just thank him for all that he has done. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I'll stand. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, a 
from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory sin's curse has lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of christ Sing with me, no guilt in life and no fear in death. No guilt in life, no fear in death. And this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath. And Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man. Till he returns or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I'll stand Till he returns or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I'll stand God is just awesome. And just pray that you sing from your hearts, focus on him today and throughout the week, and he will provide everything we ever need.
He does great things. That's all he can do is great things and good things and, and things that pertain to life. But the challenge is, is it's like us seeing an iceberg. You know about an iceberg? How much of the iceberg is above the surface? 10%. You know, we just know a little bit about what God's doing, but God's doing so much more, infinitely more than that. And every bit of it is good. God is so good. Praise God. Well, we're, uh, if there are any kids in here, it's three years old. Is Miss Lynn here? Help me, Miss Lynn. Three years old to sixth grade. We'll head that direction. Any of the uh, youth, uh, seventh through twelfth, will head that direction. I don't see too many moving, so the rest of you take some time and grease some of the people around you.
Oh, my gosh. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for connecting online. We're so grateful for you being here. Um, We've been learning about, I've been teaching about seeing truly because we live in a world that um, not everything is as you see it. Uh, we, we are becoming more and more adept and more masterful at presenting what we want people to see instead of what's really there. Because I think uh, all of us deal with a, a degree of concern of if people really knew what we were and what we do, they wouldn't want us. But I got to tell you something. Uh, people have always been fickle. And God is never. God has loved us with an everlasting love and will always love us. And God has a great plan for us. But um, we've been learning about seeing truly and how, how important that is, how valuable it is. Uh, and uh, I want to ask, I want to just share a quote with you. It's a, a quote from Henry David Thoreau. And it's, the question is not what you look at, but what you see. You know, we all look at the same stuff. And before he gets out of here, I just want to say, uh, Dan McCauley is in the back. (laughs) And he's someone that we support. He's here, and he's a great blessing to us. And he's uh, being a blessing, but he's here with us this morning and uh, is going to meet with us this week. But he and his wife are incredible gifts, and uh, we're so grateful for how God's used them and using them. And amen. And uh, I would just ask you to continue to pray for them. God's continuing to open up great doors for them. There's so much good ahead. So thank you, Dan, very much. Amen. But if we were sitting here right now, we can look around and all of us would look at the same physical things. But I can tell you right now, if I ask you what you saw, each one would report something a little bit different. There would be different things that catch your eye. And some of us wouldn't see any of the stuff that you see because it's just not on our radar. It's not something that's important to us, but it's important to you. And, and so with that in mind, we, we don't gain the whole picture. And when we don't gain the whole picture, we're not as informed and aware as, as we need to be. And uh, that's where when we, we consider children, You know, children look at some of the same things we look at, but they have a completely different perspective, a different take on it. Uh, It's just like I remember the first time I saw a microwave. And, uh, you know, it was amazing to me. I'd never seen one of those things before. and, And I saw one, and I saw how something went in, and it came out cooked. And it was like, that's awesome. Now I know how they work and everything. It's neat. I just plug in the numbers, and I push start, and that's how it works. But how many of you know there are people that look at microwaves and they see far more? They know that there is a vacuum tube that's a magnetron that produces the energy, and there is a wave guide that focuses that energy into the food, and then there is a box that contains that wave energy, that radiation, microwave radiation. Did you know that you're using radiation in your house? Some of you are like, I didn't know that, and I didn't want to know that. But, but that's where somebody who knows a whole lot more, sees below the surface, knows what they know and can do what they do to cause us to be protected and also blessed by the power that's available to be able to cook things so quickly. Because, you know, I don't know. There's got to be something else coming out a, a bit above a microwave because those things are getting slow. It's just that I'm getting more impatient. But that's where we've been learning in in some of the foundational scriptures. Uh, Isaiah 42, verse 20 in the Amplified Translation says this. You have seen many things, but you do not observe or apprehend their true meaning. And this can be said of all of us concerning all things. We, We look at things, we observe them, we apprehend them or comprehend them, but not truly, not fully, not completely. There are things missing, and the things that are missing uh, can, can be detrimental in us being able to take what we're, we're viewing and use it the best way, to the best that God has for us. 
Um, and in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, uh, we looked at this too. It says, for the Lord does not see as man sees. For a man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Every one of us, we, we look and see what we see and not the best, but we make determinations, which is another word for judgments and how we prejudge things based on just what we perceive, which is not the whole picture. Um, and many times we get it wrong. But God doesn't see the superficial. God, God doesn't see just what's going on or what's gone on. God sees all the way to the heart, the completeness of every one of us. And, and he doesn't just see what we've done or what we've we're doing. He knows what we can do. He sees the potential in every one of us, which is very rare for us to see in each other and even in ourselves. And it's so important for us not to miss out on, on the incredible gifts and blessings around us and the incredible gift and blessing God has made each one of us. Um, It's real similar to the story of an old, very old man who had lived in the backwoods up in the mountains. All his life, he had never been anywhere but there. Didn't have a TV or anything like that. And his grandson would go up and visit him on occasion. He and his, this old man and his wife lived up there. And, and uh, the grandson went up and he was visiting his grandpa. And he said, Grandpa, you know, you've lived a long time. Is there anything that you haven't done that you want to do or anything you haven't seen that you'd like to see? And he said to his grandson, you know, I've been thinking about that. I don't, I don't, I don't understand, and I want to see for myself why so many people are living in that big city. And he said, okay, Grandpa, I'll, I'll take you down there. So they got in his grandson's car, and they drove down to the city. And as he, they drove around, he, he looked around, and he was looking at the huge buildings People everywhere moving very quickly. And, and he said, you know, there are so many people here and, and there's just no room and, and they're all young and they're all in a hurry. And why would anybody want to be here? I don't understand it. And, and the grandson said, well, I can't, I can't explain it to you. I don't know. Um, is there anything else you want to see? And he said, yeah, they keep going into these buildings. I want to go into one of these buildings. I want to see what this building is like. And so they pulled over and parked and and they got out and they walked into the foyer of this building and it was huge, this really big skyscraper. And, and he just looked around and he noticed again, he said, look, all these young people going back and forth, they're moving so fast. And he said, but look. And over there was a very old lady that was moving very slowly across the foyer. And he just watched her. And she kept walking and he watched her. And she walked over to these bright, shiny silver doors and he heard a, a bell, and the doors opened up, and she walked in very slowly into the doors. And he kept looking, and he noticed above the doors there were numbers, and they were going higher and higher and higher and higher, and then they stopped. And then they started going lower and lower and lower and lower, and then he heard the bell again. And the door opened up, and out walked this vibrant, beautiful young woman. And he turned to his grandson, and he said, hurry up, let's get home and get Grandma. I wouldn't tell my grandson that. You might tell our grandson that. But, but obviously he viewed something, but he didn't understand. He, he thought he understood. And we laugh at that because it's so ridiculous. But we do some of the same things. We make a story out of something that we don't have the whole information on. And, and the truth is, none of us have all the information. All we're dealing with is what we can see, what we can perceive, what we can comprehend, what we can understand. And all of that is limited. God doesn't see that way. God sees it completely openly. Um, there's nothing that he doesn't see. And, and he, before we go any further, I just want to pray. So if you just bow your heads. 
Um, this isn't a moment to be religious. It's a moment to really relate and invite God to speak to our lives and our hearts what's going on. He knows it completely. We know in part, and he can give us what we need to be able to navigate and to stand and to overcome in whatever we're facing. So, Father, we know that you said we're two or more gathered. You're there in their midst, and so we can count on that. But, Father, we also don't just need your presence. We need your participation, and we invite you to speak to us. Father, I thank you for the privilege of, of speaking to uh, your church, Lord, your bride, the body of Christ. Uh, but, Father, I know that uh, as you use me today, I'll say a lot of things, but there's something specifically for each person that's hearing. And, Father, I pray that Holy Spirit would highlight that, make them aware that this is what you're speaking to them. These are your words of life for them. This is your rhema word, the, the sword of the Spirit to help them to be what you have for them to be and do what you have for them to do no matter what they face or encounter. And so, Father, we thank you for working in us today by your spirit and your word that you would continue to cause us to go from faith to faith and glory to glory. That, Father, we would continue to grow in your grace and in your knowledge. And we thank you, Father, for the good work that you've begun in us, that you are faithful to complete as we partner with you for your praise and your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. So he's going to guide us. He's going to guide us with his eye. That's what it says in Psalm 32, verse 8. He said he'll instruct us, and, and he'll teach us, and he'll show us the way we should go, and he'll guide us with his eye. You know, we all have plans, and, and the Bible says it's not wrong to have plans, but it says the plans that we have need to be God-directed. Because all the plans that we've had, not all of them have worked out the way we expected, did they? And God knew that before we ever started down that path. There are paths that we start down. There are plans that we have and we start to work out that are not necessarily the best, but they appear that way because all we have to go on by is what we see and what we perceive and how we understand, which is so limited. But that's why this is so important. This is so important that we realize The God is right there. The God that is wise, all wise, all powerful. Why would we ever not turn to him? Now, I, I have to say this. We are so enamored and enthralled with, with the internet, which is an amazing creation. That gives us at our fingertips the ability to research or, or see whatever we want to see, good or bad, right? Right? Okay, but uh, we use that so prolifically. I mean, we're always jumping on it, aren't we? And, and trying to find out, but is all the information on the internet true? No. <laughs> so you gotta be careful about what you're getting because what you're getting may not be the truth. And what does the truth do? You'll know the truth and the truth will what? set you free and keep you free. So if you deal with something that's not a truth or a lie, and who's the father of all lies? The enemy. And what does the enemy come to do? Steal, kill, and destroy. So if we're dealing with lies, what's behind it is the enemy and what his purpose in the lie is to steal, kill, and destroy. All of a sudden, we can't be confident. And I'm not trying to shake your confidence in the internet, but I'm telling you, you have got to be aware of what your receiving. And it's not just there. It's on TV. It's, it's everywhere. But there's one place, one place that you can absolutely be sure that you will always get truth. And that's with God, with his word and being guided by his spirit. Because God can't give anything but truth. And that's where He's the one. As much as we rely on the internet and, you know, something will go on and we'll quickly jump on and we'll research and we'll get all the input we can from all the different sources. Some of them we know, some of them we don't. And we kind of do our own mental spreadsheet on that and kind of determine what we're going to do with information that isn't absolutely accurate all the time. Instead of 
There's, does anybody's internet go out be, besides mine sometimes? Okay. Uh, and maybe it's not the internet. It may be my connection to the internet. But I've got to tell you something. My connection with God is never out. Your connection with God is never out. As a matter of fact, God wanted to make so sure that you would never be separated from connected, being connected with him. When you receive Christ as your Lord, he came to live in you. There's no one and nothing that can be closer to you than God. More available to us than God. And yet, in, in my life, because I have become so habitualized to searching for information by what I see, what I hear, what, what I can comprehend or what I can gain through the internet or information from other people, that it hasn't always been God that was my first turn. I didn't always turn to him first, but I'm going to tell you something. I have made a determination in my life. I have said to God, God, I don't want to rely on myself. I don't want to rely on others. I don't want to rely on the wisdom of man, but I do want to rely on you first and foremost. Because I know if I will receive from you, I'll have the best guidance. I'll have the best information. I'll have the best plan. And, and so, Lord, help me to to take that moment and pause when something happens instead of just going to work to try and figure out pause stop somebody shared this with me uh, I don't know if it was this morning or this week that one of their favorite scriptures is be still and know that I am God you know we're so busy it's hard for us to know anything or anyone but God's saying come on Take a minute. Pause. Put everything else aside and get to know me. Because in knowing God, you're going to know the creator of everything. The one who knows everything. The one who can do everything. The one that doesn't just know out there. Because we've been looking at how this works. We, we looked at... David's life and how his dad and his brothers and even the prophet Samuel that was sent by God to, to anoint the new king looked at everybody and, and David was their last choice. Nobody thought David was going to be king. His dad didn't, his brothers didn't, and even the prophet didn't initially until he listened to God. And God said, that's the one. Anoint him. And David became the greatest king that Israel ever had but they could have missed it if they did, weren't directed by God. And then we, we saw how Israel was misled and ended up making a covenant with some people that God told them not to because what they did, Joshua and Israel, when they got into the promised land, people came to them, had old clothes, old dusty, moldy bread, uh, old wine skins that had been patched, old sandals and, and dust on their camels. And they said, we've come from a far way away and they were just down the road. And they ended up not consulting with God and, and became covenant partners with somebody that God told them not to be. You see, the enemy is a master of deception. And if we're not being influenced by God, then we're going to be influenced by him. And all of us have a degree of deception in our lives. We have blind spots that we can't see ourselves. There are blind spots and prejudices of how we see other people. And only God sees clearly, and we need to see as God sees. Because if we are guided by his eye, you know, the Bible talks about the blind leading the blind. And to some degree, that's what we are. Because who can tell me what's going on in that room? You're like, are you kidding me? Well, I can tell you God can. God sees that room, this room, that room. And every room. And so what we see in part. And, and that's, what, that's what the Bible tells us. We looked at, at, at that in 1 Corinthians 13, 11. It says we don't see things clearly in uh, 
the message translation. But what precedes that is, when I was a child, I thought as a child and I spoke as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. And it doesn't matter how chronologically old we grow, we still will never reach the ability God has to see things clearly. We're going to understand things more, but never the way God does. And so we, we face things as children many times because we're so limited and God is so unlimited. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13 in the ERV translation, it says this, nothing in all the world can be hidden from God. He can clearly see all things. Everything is open. Now that is an amazing statement, but it's also unnerving because as much as we can put on the persona that we want to portray to everybody else, God knows exactly what's going on inside us. And, and he's not judging us and condemning us, but he's not fooled by us. You know, religious people go to God with, with a certain air and way as if to endear themselves to God. You can't endear yourself more to God than you already are. God has loved you with an everlasting love. And what happens is when we start to use these facades, oh, almighty God, okay, he is almighty, but is that the way you see him all the time or is that just you trying to get his attention? Because God sees through that. You know, one of the greatest things about the Psalms when you read through the Psalms, not everybody's happy. Not everybody's having their best, best day. Some people are mad and hurt and broken. But the one thing about the Psalms, you know the Psalms are songs? They're all songs. And they're sung to God. And, and they're real. Now, the one thing that you can see, when somebody is sad or broken or hurt, and they turn to God and they release to God and they receive from God, they're changed. They don't stay broken. They don't stay hopeless. They don't stay hurt. Because they have looked and seen God and heard from God, God has had this impact on their lives and they're changed. God wants to change you and your life and heal your hurts and help you see in a way that he sees that's different than how you see that you would have hope. You know, we talked about that a few, few weeks ago. It's a confident expectation of good. And every one of us as Christians should have hope because God is a God of hope that fills us with joy and peace and believing. And that's what's going to sustain us in the days we're living in because God has said in his word that these days that we're living in are wicked that they're dark, that they're desperate, and they're difficult. And you and I are here to have an impact and an influence during that time on people that are being affected by all this where we're being influenced and affected by God. And we have a hope. We're able to see through the, the stuff that's going on to a God that's right there with us and for us and can, can bring us through any and everything that we face, any obstacle, any opposition. And so we're not overwhelmed by what we see or the circumstances that surround us, just like, like the Apostle Paul was not when he was in the ship and in the hurricane and it was breaking up and, and he had hope. He had a confident expectation and helped everybody else in the ship realize if they'd put their hope in God, they'd be okay. But everything is open before God, and so we need his help and his guidance to help see things the way they are. Because we don't. And because of that, when we don't, we experience some degree of deception, and that deception robs us of the good that God has for us, and it's all around us. Just like children. The Bible tells us in Psalm 127 that every child is a blessing and a gift from the Lord. Amen. It doesn't say every child, when they come in from this result, is a blessing and gift. Every child that comes into the world is a blessing and a gift from God. 
it never changes because God never changes every child. But what about, you know, we live here in central New York. We've got a few large prisons, not as many as we used to have, but we have some large prisons. Those people that are incarcerated, that are locked up in those prisons for doing the things that they've done, they're a blessing and a gift given by God. Amen. We see them as dangerous or, or people that have done so much wrong, but I'm telling you, God is not unaware of what they've done. But God still holds to the fact that he gave them. They are a blessing and a gift. That's what God designed them for. And what happened? Life. Stuff happens to people. And, and for whatever reason, whether it was something that a parent did or didn't do or a neighbor or a stranger or, a, you know, whatever it was. They're where they are right now, but God sees them as this person that he loves. They were given as a blessing and a gift. God has a plan for them that's for good. It's not changed. God's not given up on them, whether their family or anybody else has given up on them. God will never give up on anyone. And we look... And we see something, and God looks, and God sees something different. And he doesn't just do that with them. He does that with every one of us. Is God ignorant of what we do? No, he's not. But he is majoring on who he made you to be and what he has made you to do. Because he has a plan for you that's for good. That's how he sees you. And what would happen? What would happen if we began to see as God sees? We see truly other people. Man, what a different world this would be. What if, what if we just in this church, you know, somebody does something wrong or something that hurts us or something we don't agree with, but we don't see them as a problem. We see them as priceless as a treasure, as a gift given by God. And yeah, they've done some things wrong, but who of us haven't? Mm -hmm. We began to value other people. But you know, it doesn't just happen with other people. It's not just with stuff out there we, we see and we're not seeing truly. One of the biggest challenges we have is seeing ourselves truly. Because we view ourselves so many times in light of what has happened or what is happening. Because we don't know what's going to happen. And unless we believe what God says, we don't have a lot of expectation for the future. Because we look back and, and tell me, when you look back on your life, do you have the tendency to look at the bad things or the good things? And there's a reason for that. Because many times the one that's influencing us is the enemy. And in, in Revelation chapter 12, he's called the accuser of the brethren. When somebody accuses you, they find fault with you. And he's always accusing, always accusing, accusing you to somebody else. He's saying, you know that Fran, that Fran Reed? I'm just picking on Fran because I saw her. And, and the enemy's not going to ever say anything good about somebody. And no matter what he says, it's, it's wrapped up in a lie. There may be a little truth, but he's going to embellish it and, and, and make it bigger than it is. And then, then you're going to go around looking at that person and thinking, ooh. But you got nothing to base it on. They did what they did, but you don't know why they did it. You know hurting people hurt people. Many times we do what we do because of what's going on in us. And, and, and it's not so much wanting to hurt other people. It's just that hurt that starts to bubble up and flow over. And what do hurting people need? They need help. 
They need love. They need healing. But they're not going to get that if we're looking at them in a way that God's not looking at them. But that's where we, we, we look at ourselves and we see ourselves as the enemy accuses others to us, he accuses us to us. And he'll say to us, you'll never amount to anything. You, you couldn't possibly do that. Look what you've done. Look at the failures. Look, look, at, look at the messes you've made. Look at the wrong choices you've, you've chosen. And all of a sudden we feel like, oh, we can't do anything. It's not much different than what we see in, in the life of a man in the Old Testament. He's fairly well known. His name is Gideon. And we're going to look at him this morning um, and just quickly see how God sees and how he saw himself and how wrong he was. Because right now today, sitting here, there is not a one of us that sees ourselves fully and to tell you the truth most of us look at ourselves through the flaws and the frailties and the failures and God is not ignorant to that but God sees you as the gift and blessing that he brought you into this world as and he sees you with the plan that he has for you for good and not for evil with a future and a hope and because of that, he never gives up on anyone. So when we go to Judges chapter 6, I'll set the stage. What's happened is uh, the book of Judges is about Israel and how they would follow God. And somewhere along the line, they get tempted. They'd go off track with God, get into sin, and God would send a judge to expose their sin, to correct them, get them back in line with God, and then they track with God for a while, and then they get tempted and go off into sin again, and God has sent another judge. Well, in, in chapter 6, um, Gideon is approached by God, and, and Gideon was a great judge and an amazing military commander. Uh, one of, one of the, the greatest battles uh, was won by Gideon. And the way God did it uh, was he, he called down the troops to a point where they were so small, everybody knew it couldn't be anything but God. Because God wants the credit. And the reason why is because if God can do it through any one of us, then he can do it through any one of us. And so from that standpoint, if it's about us and what we can do, well, everybody else is in trouble because nobody can be like us. And the Bible says it's Christ in us that's the hope of glory. It's not about us being so great. As a matter of fact, the Bible says God takes the weak, the foolish, and the base. I qualify. And he likes to do that because he wants to show people what he can do through people who will trust him and allow him to guide, govern, and guard them. But right, right here in chapter 16, uh, Israel had gotten into sin again. They had turned away from God. Uh, the Midianites were attacking them, robbing them of all their food and all their stuff. And so they're deathly afraid of the Midianites coming in and, and pillaging them again. And so uh, it, we pick it up where the angel of the Lord came and sat under a terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abazite. And while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide from the Midianites. Now, I told you the Midianites would come in and steal everything. So uh, Gideon has found some wheat. He's threshing it. He's separating the chaff from the, the seed, the kernels. And, and he's doing it in the most appropriate place, right? The wine press. And, and why is he doing it there? He's hiding. Yeah. So... Gideon, too, was being terrorized and afraid of the Midianites, didn't want to lose what he had, and so he does the best he can, and he's now trying to get a little bit of grain together to be able to 
probably make some flour to make some bread. And uh, this angel is watching him. The angel of the Lord is watching him. And the angel of the Lord appears to him and says, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. No response. Is that what it is? What, what, what does it look like? Does he look like this mighty man of valor? This brave warrior, like one translation says? No. He looks as afraid and scared as anybody else. But the angel of the Lord says, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. If we heard somebody say that to him while he was doing that, we'd say, you're nuts. Wouldn't we? Yes. Or maybe we wouldn't say it. We'd just think it. That person has no idea what he's like. But who would be the one who has no idea of what he's like? We wouldn't. We would have no clue as much as we have everything pointing to what we think he is. But God says this is what he is. He's a mighty man of valor. So all those around that might have seen this would have disagreed. And the angel says to him, the Lord is with you. And, and what's Gideon's response? It's amazing. When we look at the next verse, we see what Gideon responds as. And he says this. Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> right? We get that way too. But, but how does he start out? Oh, my Lord. <laughs> and then, then he goes on to say, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? You know, that's not too far from us. We think if bad things happen to us, that God's left us. He's forgotten about us. He's gotten too busy. We're not on his radar. He doesn't know what's going on. And so we have to wake him up and tell him what's going on. Do you know that you're the apple of his eye? There's never a time, a moment, a second, a nanosecond that he is not fully aware of everything that is transpiring with your life within you, around you. He knows it all. And he wants to be involved, but he will not be involved in your life or my life until we allow him to. He'll let us run our own lives. He will not control us. And we sometimes blame him that he's forgotten about us. He's not taking care of us because of the bad things. But the reason why this happened, if you go back to the beginning of this chapter, it says that Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And what, what, what is the result of sin? Death. Right. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. That is what's connected. You can't disconnect that. But what can happen, you know, if we sin... Death is coming. But one of the things that God can do, it's kind of like gravity. Gravity works all the time, right? On the earth. But how do we overcome gravity? Lift and thrust, right? A plane goes, there's, there's thrust that make the plane go ahead and lift because of the wings and it breaks, it overcomes gravity. And so I want you to know that if, even though we may have sinned in our life, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the love of God can help us overcome the results of sin in our lives. God can redeem and work it for good. Yeah. But who can do that? Can you do that? Oh, you can. No. Oh, can Pastor Gabe, can you do that? Oh, you can. Debbie, can you do that? There's not a one of us or all of us together. Can we do that? Only God can do that. That's why we have to turn to him and trust in him and allow him to guide us, to govern us, to guard us 
so that even when we've gotten off track and we've gotten to sin and, and death is working, God can redeem it and work it for good. But he blames God that, that this is because you're doing this and God wasn't. And then the Lord said to him, go in this might of yours and you will save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? It's almost like he's not listening to him. You know, sometimes it's really good that God doesn't respond to what we're saying to him. And in this moment, he's just staying on track. God's not going to get distracted by our whines or, or by us accusing him of something he didn't do because he knows better. He's going to keep on the truth. And the truth is, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. But God's not with me. Look at what's going on. How could he be with me because all this bad stuff is happening? Do you know that Jesus gave us a promise? He said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation, difficulties, hard times, trouble. Why did he promise that? Because he knew it was going to happen and he knew we needed to know. But he said, be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. Amen. Whatever you face, God's overcome. And the only way you and I are going to overcome it is by him. By, by trusting in him and being guided by him, guided by his eye because he'll instruct us and he'll teach us in the way to go because there are ways that seem right unto us, Proverbs says, whose end is the way of death. We can't trust even us knowing what's the right way. But we can trust God and he's available. He's not going to ever say, I'm call me back in a week. He's never too busy for us. But he also won't do what we want him to do the way we want him to do it when we want him to do it all the time. Because if that were the case, we'd be God and he wouldn't. Go in this might of yours and you'll save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? And here goes Gideon. Oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. Who's he looking at? Himself. How did God, the angel of the Lord, start this out? Do you remember? You remember what he said? Who was with Gideon? The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. As long as God is with you, you can be anything and everything he has for you to be because he sees you different than you see you. And when he tells you that, I want you to know, you and I are going to react just the way Gideon does. We're going to see us in light of this kind of stuff. Well, uh, my clan is, is the weakest and my father's family is the weakest of the weakest clan. So we're the lowest of the lowest. This couldn't possibly happen to me. You got the wrong guy. Does that strike a bell with any of us? Where we've, we've told God, you got the wrong person. How arrogant. I remember telling God that. You're talking to me? No, you can't be serious. You have for me to, to get up in front of people and speak? No, you. Yeah, you're so funny. You're also delusional. Because I know me. I know what I've done. I've never been able to speak in front of people. I've never been able to speak to more than two people at a time. And even at that, when I spoke, I'd stutter. God was relentless, like he thought he was right. <laughs> and I kept proving to him I couldn't do it. Do you know why? Because I wasn't trusting him. And without him, I couldn't do it. Every Sunday, outside of God and me, the only person that knows what a miracle this is is her. Amen. I couldn't even speak to her the first time I saw her. 
I was too afraid. And it's not been that I just jumped up and all of a sudden this happened. This has been painful and difficult and an amazing blessing. And just like Gideon, how can I, how can I do this? Lord, I can't do this. But God, you're telling me I can do this. You're telling me this is what you have for me to do. But God, everything in my life points to the fact that I can't. I've failed. I've failed. I've been a failure in this area. But you say I can. And I got to choose who I'm going to believe. Am I going to believe my past and what I've done without relying on you? Or am I going to believe you? Is Gideon going to believe that he's just a part of the weakest clan and his father's house is the weakest in the weakest clan and so he couldn't possibly do this? Or is he going to choose to walk by faith and not by sight? We talk about this. We know this. But this is where it comes down to. Will we do it? Will we choose to believe God over us, over our history, over our experience, over people's expectations? Because if you'll dare to do that, you, like Gideon, will experience some of the greatest things in your life because that's what God has for you. Some of the most amazing, outstanding things that God will do through you, and as much as other people will be shocked by that, the person that will be more shocked than anybody will probably be you. You'll be like, I can't believe God did that. God, you really did say that, and you really did do that. But it's not just us saying, okay, God, do what you want. It's about us partnering, us really believing, not letting the accuser remind you of your past, your failures, your frailties, your flaws, because we all have them. God is not surprised by that. He uses frail, flawed failures to do the amazing things he has because that's not what he created you as. That's what you and I made ourselves, what we did on our own without him, probably with help of other people. But now with God's help, we can be what he said we can be and we can do what he said we can do that nobody else would ever believe or dream we could do. But if not, we're going to let the past Rob us of the present and the future God has. And if it robs us, if we allow that to rob us of what God has for us because we don't see ourselves the way God sees us, we see ourselves through all that junk that God can work for good if we'll let him. We just have to leave it with God and say, it's yours, you work it out. But that's where when we look at God and we allow God to have his way, all of a sudden that can't rob us and in turn rob everybody else God has for us to impact. If I had believed what I had experienced, I had proven time and time again I couldn't speak to more than two people. I could never speak in front of people. Physiologically, I would just stutter and break down and just couldn't speak. If I hadn't believed God in spite of that, somebody else would be here, but I wouldn't. And God would, God would make sure, because he loves you, make sure that you were being taken care of, but I would miss one of the greatest blessings. And gifts that God has allowed me to be a part of. But I had to believe him over what I had believed. And in verse 16, we see what Gideon's response was. I'm sorry. This is why the Lord said he could do what he did. The Lord said to him, surely I will be with you and you will defeat the Midianites as one man. What, what, 
What empowered him to be able to be the amazing commander and judge that he was? Nothing but the presence of God, his reliance on God, his allowing God to use him who he saw himself as the least of the least of the least. But God saw him as a great judge and an amazing, victorious commander. And you can't be both of those things at the same time, the least of the least of the least and all of those other things. We have to let go of what we see and what other people have seen in us to see us as God sees us so we can be what God has for us to be and do what God has for us to do. I want you to know, every one of you, every one of you, it doesn't matter what your past is, Every one of you is a world changer. The one who created the world wants to work in you and through you to change the world you live in, to impact the people around you, to give them hope, to bring healing and wholeness to their lives, to bring eternity in heaven to them. But you've got to believe it. You, you, you have to choose to close your eyes from seeing what you've seen before and begin to see with God's eyes who you are. Because the only one that knows you is God. He knows you completely. And he's got a plan for you. It's a plan for good and not for evil with a future and a hope. That he has planned to do exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think according to the power that's at work in you. Cause you to be overwhelmingly more than a conqueror in all things through Christ. Yeah, I mean, you, may, you may have failed, you may have fallen, but God has for you to overcome. And those things that have overwhelmed you to show the world around you what he can do through someone who will allow him. Like every head bowed, every eye closed. I just want you to close your eyes and, and just not be concerned about anything else around you at this moment. I just want you to listen to one last scripture in the book of Zephaniah. Chapter 3, verse 17. This is in the easy to read version and it's, it's just so good. Just listen. The Lord your God is with you. He is like a powerful soldier. He will save you. He will show you how much he loves you and how happy he is with you. Now right there, every eye closed, every head bowed. You, you, you've heard that, but you, it's, it's, there's a pushback. And I, I felt it in the first service. I felt it in myself when I read that. And God said, this, you read this to you. This is for me, about you. And I was like, oh, God, I, uh. God said, this is to you. This is about you. It's not about somebody else. It's about you. And I need you, my child, my beloved, my gift and blessing that I brought into this world, I need you to begin to receive how I see you, not how you see you or others see you. You need to see truly, and you haven't. But you need to be freed of the bondages and the damage that's been done to you by how you viewed yourself and how others have viewed you. I'm with you. I'll save you. I'll show you how much I love you and how happy I am with you. Father, I pray right now for every person here, every person watching online. I pray for healings to occur. Father, the damage that's been done in hearts and souls of people, of all of us, by what other people have said and what we have thought and what we have chosen to, to believe. Father, the only truth in all of this is what you've said. The rest of it is subject to change, but your truth will never change. 
You created us and brought us into this world as a gift and a blessing. And Father, I pray that your people would rise up and fulfill that which you have created them for, to be gifts and blessings to all those around them in spite of what people do. Father, I thank you that, that your people are going to get a new perspective. You're not in heaven with a frown and angry, but you're rejoicing over your people. Not everything they do, but who they are, who you made them to be, who you know them to be, and who you will help them to be. Lord, I don't know how you do it, but I know you can do it. Break the chains, the bonds of lies in, in our lives. Lies others have spoken of us. Lies that we have spoken of ourselves and let the truth, let the truth reside and remain in us, your truth. Father, I thank you. I thank you for a new and living way to walk in. I thank you that we are going to guard our hearts from anything that's not true. We're going to rely on you to help us to see as you see. Guide us with your eye. Even as we look in the mirror and those old, old voices tell us what they used to tell us. Father, I thank you that we are not going to listen to those anymore. We're going to hear that we're your beloved. That we're the apple of your eye. That you have a plan for us for good and not for evil with a future and a hope. And if we're experiencing the obstacles and the opposition, the battles that you are going to cause us as we look to you, as we listen for you, as we're guided by you and governed by you, you are going to bring us through and into the victory and the fullness of what you have. We thank you, Father, for this. Father, I thank you for a refreshing coming to your people. Just like a wind that would blow through and just clear out the stuff that has been so that the truth would remain. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before we dismiss, I just want to say this. God wants to work in every one of our lives. But God will never force his, himself or his way on us. And so we have, to, we have to be willing to recognize we need his help, humbly saying, Lord, I can't do this without you, and I, I want to do what you have for me to do. But it starts with us turning to him and trusting him with our lives. And, and I'm going to ask you just one more time to just close your eyes. Because I don't want anybody to be hindered from responding because you're concerned about what anybody else thinks. All of us have to break free of that, but that may not be this morning. But if you're here and you've never trusted in the Lord, you have never turned your life over to the Lord. Maybe you didn't realize you needed to. Uh, never, maybe you never thought that it, was, it would be a good thing for you to do because you wanted to control. But I want you to know, you controlling your life is never going to be what God controlling your life will be. Because God's the only one that can lead you in the fullness of life. And so if you're here and, and you've never trusted in the Lord, I just want you to lift your hand and say, today, I want to put my trust in the Lord. I want him to be my Lord. And I, I believe everyone here has done that. If you haven't, don't leave here today without, without seeing me or Pastor Gabe. Uh, we want to pray with you. We want you to have a brand new start. God wants this to be the beginning of the best life you can live. And the only way we can live that is with him because he's the only one that knows what our best life is. So, Father, right now, I thank you. I thank you for everyone who has, has trusted and believed in you. Lord, that has taken you as their Lord and Savior. But, Father, doing that, it's an everyday Event. It's not a past thing. I made Jesus Lord. He is presently Lord. That means he's in control. He's guiding, he's governing, and he's guarding. And Father, help us to be more sensitive and attentive 
and perceptive of you. Before we just make a plan, help us turn to you. Before we jump on the internet, help us consult with you. Let us not lean on our own understanding, but rely on you and trust in you with our whole heart. Let us be guided by your eye. Father, help us to not judge before we know what your truth is. And help us to always view people with your love, your mercy, and your compassion. And we thank you, Father, for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? Thank you for coming today. I believe that God gave each one of us, he did for me, gave us what we needed to go through this week and, and, and see him in a way we haven't. You at home, the same thing. I just want to pray over you before we go. Father, I thank you for every one of your children. I thank you for those that are here, those that are online. I thank you for your presence with us as we go that you go before us and prepare the way. You know everything about us and you guide us in paths of righteousness for your namesake. You're our rear guard. You uphold us with your right hand of righteousness and you cover us with your songs of life and of hope and of joy and peace and love, of truth, of victory. The Father, as we walk in this world, we know we are not of this world. But heaven is our home, and we have an opportunity now to reveal heaven on earth to all those around us. We thank you, Father, for this in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Have a great week.